Hello, my name is Jeremy, and I'm very pleased to present at the CNI4 meeting, the Incubate service that we've been building in Geneva, Switzerland. I work as an assistant in information science at the University of Applied Science and Arts, and with three colleagues, Ami Alwash, Arno Gonina, and Oni Schneider, we prepared this um, project briefing. The, um, this short presentation is divided into three parts. First of all, I will explain why we decided to create a supplementary service for locating person identifiers in Switzerland, then a few elements on the choice of identifier, namely ARC, and finally, a few more slides about the project. As you may be well aware, a PID is a long-lasting and bionic reference to a digital resource technically consists of a server that is able to forward or resolve identifiers to its corresponding web address. A PID has usually two parts, um, an identifier that can ensure the provenance of a resource and a location for the resource over time. Basically, even if the web address changes, normally a given PID should still resolve to its new location. And if you take a look at the anatomy of a digital object identifier, there is a resolver service, a prefix, which is a number consisting of 10, which is the handle as part of the DOI namespace, and the number of the assigning body. And finally, uh, the third part, um, the suffix, which identifies the resource. It is obvious that an identifier can only be persistent if there is a sustainable infrastructure or ecosystem in the background. And for this reason, I would like to give a shout out to John Kunze, the person who created the Archival Resource Ski Scheme, who in August 2018 wanted to debunk some of the myths surrounding PIDs. Um, any serious cultural orientation organization should consider these um, statements. As the sole university in the French-speaking Switzerland offering a curriculum in information science, we are very attached to the preservation and traceability of information. So these assertions are therefore in line with what we want to achieve. In Switzerland, we have several infrastructures or services providing PIDs and mainly DUIs. Um, there is a mixture of monopolized attribution. Um, sometimes those policies are cont contradictory for and also works in progress and unclear legal issues, which leads to an unsatisfying and confusing situation. So that's why we wanted to build uh, something else. And here you have in the, in the map, uh, for example, the ETR in Zurich um, is the main provider of uh, DOI. Um, they are a member of the data site, but it's quite uh, costly and it's going to be even more in the um, next year, apparently. Uh, FORCE, which is for uh, science, uh, social sciences in, in, in Lausanne, they do provide DOI, but it's not for everything. The um, data lifecycle management, DSM, is more for long-term archival purposes, and not all data can actually um, be deposit there, deposited there. Zenodo, that you may know, um, is from the CERN, the European Organization for Nuclear Research, but it's actually not legally in Switzerland nor in France. It's extraterritorial, so you have some legal issues if you deposit everything there. And then the DASH, uh, the Data Service Center for the Humanities, so as the name said, uh, is restrained to uh, data in the humanities. So most of them use DOIs, and then you have only uh, Dash, which leverages uh, the ARC scheme. The scheme that we actually are going to, to, to use as well. So um, I'm not going to talk about ARC, uh, which is for us the best choice to satisfy the scientific and cultural heritage sectors in Switzerland, in our opinion. The information in the following slides come mainly from the ARCs in the Open Initiative, which will soon change its name to Arc Alliance, and you have here two different URIs when you can find more information. So Arc is a scheme that was created in 2001 by the California Digital Library, and we can see that now over 600 organizations of the world are registered to assign Arc identifiers. 
These organizations are mostly based in North America and France, but we've also been seeing adoptions in um, different parts of the world, such as in South America and India. One of the very neat thing with ARC is that it can be assigned to absolutely anything from your search data to bibliographic records or vocabulary terms. And you have here a list of example, but basically anything that would need an identifier can get an archival resource key. If you start assigning ARCs, you can indeed set up your own local resolver, which will also benefit from name to thing, um, which is a global resolver. So on the table, you can see uh, an example of the same identifier from the French National Library. And this um, manuscript uh, not only points, points to, um, to the entire document, if you will, but to a particular page of this dissertation, which you have here uh, on, the, on the slide. Uh, so to the folio number 29. An R can be subdivided into different parts. Um, we, we've so that with the uh, structure of the DI, so the same thing with the ARC, but with more details. So here we can see on the top that there are three main things to distinguish, the resolver service, the base object name, and, and that's very important um, and relevant for us, the qualifiers, uh, which we saw in the BNF example as well. If we go into in a little more detail, we can see that the last two parts can also be divided. So it, you will generally find the ARC label, um, the name assigning authority number that any organization can obtain as soon as they register, the assigned name, which is like the suffix in the in the DOI, um, then uh, you have a very fine level of granularity where we can further differentiate elements such as pages, chapters, verse shading, um, and even formats, you name it. You can uh, divide the way you want your um, data set, for instance. Uh, name to thing n to t um, is a global arc resolver and it is actually for mapping names into things. So it knows where to root over 900 of the types of an identifier. And when a resolution request comes in from the general public, n to t looks up the identifiers and redirects the original link to a forwarded link. But to do this, it uses two different resolution patterns. Um, to begin, entity tries to resolve according to information found in an individual stored identifier. And failing that, entity tries to resolve according to any stored class rules based on the identifier type. So we have many advantages to, to use ARCs. Um, first of all, it's free to register. Of course, it's not free to maintain um, an infrastructure, but still, if you want to obtain a name assigning authority number, you will have it for free. And um, it can be seen that ARCs can provide a very fine level of granularity through the use of parallel subdomains, as well as qualifiers. So each organization is able to implement their own ARC policy and naming practices. And something that's quite neat, in my opinion, is the its, its ability to fit with the IIIF image API canonical URI syntax, uh, which is not the case for most BIDs. With all these factors in mind, you can perhaps better understand why we have chosen ARCs as an identifier within the e, uh, Inkipit project. So the project started in January this year is fi financed by the P5 program of Swiss universities. And we've been collaborating closely uh, with the um, Swiss Institute of Bi Bioinformatics, uh, which is one of our partners, but also with the California Digital Library, EasyID, Arcs in the Open, now Arc Alliance. And thanks to them, we've been able to, um, to develop that infrastructure. So it will allow organizations to create identifiers with a very fine level of granularity that can reflect complex object hierarchies, as well as being able to retain traceability version, uh, versioning, sorry, or even information to the object's persistence. We've already started testing and within the next few weeks, we will start to actually assign our identifiers. And you can see in that um, diagram, uh, the different, um, so how we explain that to our customers uh, once they have 
um, an arc link uh, the end user can request it and how it's going to be forwarded uh, also through an entity. So I'm not going to, to give um, a demo, but we basically have like is the ID, a user interface and an API. Um, this is here the, the prototype. We've been reusing the easy ID components. Um, we will of course have our own design and when we will upgrade the different components, we want the easy ID infrastructure to benefit from that as well. So that was part, let's say of the deal that basically we would, um, what we do, uh, any tools that we're going to create can be uh, then later reused by uh, the CDL. For the year 2021, um, again with funding from Swiss universities, we will continue to develop the infrastructure. So the main goal of the Incubit CRIS, uh, that's a new name of the project, um, is to combine a basic service for assigning ARCs, which is uh, here Incubit 1 uh, on that slide, with a current research information system, a CRIS, as well as a set of algorithm for search, disambiguation and interoperability. So more on that, uh, maybe next year than at a future CNI meeting, uh, but that's what we're going to do next year, just to develop the infrastructure and still and stabilize the um, ARC allocating service. So the creation of a service is never done alone. And I would like to thank again all the people uh, on this slide. So our partner from SIB, uh, uh, so Nolan Nadery, Julien Gobel, Luc Motin, Patrick Roche, uh, from the CDL, Iziadi, John Kunzi, Kurt Evaldson, Maya Gould, uh, Greg Janet from uh, UC Santa Barbara, as well as our partner, uh, financial partner, Audio Day and Annie Craft, and of course, Arcs in the Open Arc Alliance for um, very, interesting uh, conversations. So thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions or remarks, I will happily answer them. <laughs>